You don't want to miss this episode where we talk about API Builder with Jerry just here. Stay tuned. Hey, Jerry, can you tell us more about API Builder? What it does, what it, what it is, everything. Yeah, especially what it is, no doubt about it. So Data API Builder, or DAB as we call it, right? And so DAB. <laughs> uh, so the, it's, a, it's an open source project that basically allows you to set on top of your database an API layer. And the idea is we want to be able to really give some candy to developers to be able to say, we know what you're doing when you're building applications, we know how your tiers are laid out and we wanna be able to replace one of those because it's just repetitive code over and over again. And we wanna build something, not just that's open source, but that works great in the cloud, but also works great on-prem as well. So we don't wanna be able to tie people down and say, now that you're using this, we you know, can prescribe the technology that you wanna use. We wanna kind of meet you where you are. So let's consider a regular application. The separation of concerns, it's more important than ever. And honestly, it's kind of, the knee-jerk reaction for developers when they're building an application. You don't have to tell them to build layers. They build layers because it's just part of our instinct now. It's proven and we understand it. And so this is pretty typical, right? We have client, API, and a uh, database. That would be our three-tier application that's pretty common. And the idea around DAB is to say, we want to take that middle piece, that API, and we want to replace it completely with something that can be built for you based on just standards that are out there that everybody else is following. So the, the nice part about DAB is it gives you both a REST API and a GraphQL API, but to get it, all you need is a configuration file. Basically, it's a JSON file that describes the data in your database. Uh, we support uh, MySQL, we support uh, Postgres, Cosmos DB, and of course, Microsoft SQL as well. And it can be on-prem or in the cloud, either way. The, the entire system runs inside a container and it makes it so that you can deploy this locally, have a beautiful and identical experience to what you have in production, which is great, um, as well as because it's in a container, again, the deployment options are, are endless as a result. So uh, it's, you know, we, we made sure it's secure and scalable, but because it's open source, you can evaluate that yourself and just see that all the first principles that we led into this, we followed through on. And, and today it is private preview, uh, public preview, sorry, and we hope to have it as um, GA sometime maybe January of next year. So oh, just right around the corner. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. Right so you mentioned like it can run in in, that, in the cloud and on prem. So it, it's just requesting a, a connection string. So even if I'm running my database in a container, will it work? Even if you're running your day, yeah, that's the, an ideal situation actually. So you would have your database in a container. And you can have then your API layer in a container as well. Move those to any machines that you want them to okay. be. Sure. So it's, it's just sure. required a connection string and DAB can connect to my database and help. Yeah, as long as those containers can speak to each other, there's no yeah. problem. Yeah. And what's great about it, and you know, because it's open source, you, you know, we you can evaluate this yourself. When this is just how you would have written it yourself. Like that's what's bizarre. You're right, you're getting these APIs, and there's nothing exotic here, it's just standard. Uh, REST or GraphQL implementation. And it's pretty great. We've been adding features like hand over fist and a lot of things are really coming together. We're seeing the community contribute to this as well. And so we're really happy with kind of where things are. If, if you're ready to get started, the, the easiest way really is to think about the command line. We do everything through CLI today and we're working on a UI as a matter of fact, but right now we have the CLI, we install it as a .NET tool. You can install it globally or locally. And the uh, just once you have it installed, all you have to say is dab start. Dab start then looks for your config file. Once it finds it, it uses the config file to find, like you were saying, the connection string, or and to understand the entities in your database. So you may have 100 tables, but you only want to expose 20. No problem. That's what the configuration file is for. And your individual tables may have, let's say, again, 100 columns, and you only want to expose 20. No problem. That's what the configuration file is for as well. So it really gives you a lot of flexibility to expose the data the way you want to, uh, handle permissions of read and CRUD operations the way that you want to, want to on individual objects as well. So it's, it's pretty great. Um, once we have it running, once the container is, is running, uh, Swagger is there so you can evaluate the, um, the signatures and the different uh, contracts of the endpoints. We can use open API, or let me say that backwards, sorry. Open API is for doing that. 
We have Swagger so that if you're the, using the REST endpoints, you can go in and do the evaluation right there, which is really beautiful. Or uh, you can do the same thing with GraphQL, just slash GraphQL. And we have, um, we have Banana Cake Pop built right in as well, which is sort of the swagger of it. So um, let me start by just showing you some of the basics and how we would get that pulled together. So I have a database today that is, it's a very simplistic database. It has three tables of, um, of books and authors. Nothing really simple. We use this for almost all of our demos. Um, there are no extra pieces to it. It's it's probably um, it's probably the least reflective of a real world database because it has like three tables. But it's a great place to start to just see how it works. Yeah, indeed. Why adding complexity when you want to show? Yeah, other stuff. A, I would rather explain Dab than explain my scenario. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Yeah, for sure. And so let me pull up what a config file might look like in uh, for that. So I have my database here, uh, or I have my configuration file that starts with all the runtime information. And so the runtime information goes um, all right, for one, well, make sure I'm in the right schema so that we can start to version this later. And then to def describe my data source, and for me, it's just the Microsoft SQL Server that's running locally. I'm just using local DB that's installed automatically with Visual Studio. And uh, I, I tell it what my connection string is to get there, just like you would expect. By the way, if you don't like putting your password in the connection string, which I of course don't either, this is just the developer environment. Um, we can read it from the connect. We can read it from environment variables, just like you would expect. Or we can support um, active after directory. We can bring in tokens. Whatever kind of um, security scheme that you're already using is hopefully what we're trying to support and make it so that developers don't have to change anything inside their application just because DAB is part of it now. So that's, that's great. So all those options for securities are already supported. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, it's it's really neat stuff. Everything I'm telling you is, is going to be fully supported. Yeah, for sure. And uh, the, the in the runtime settings, so these are kind of like the global settings. They have nothing. They have more to do with how you want DAB to work than uh, anything about your database. And so in this case, I'm saying, for example, I want to uh, enable uh, the graph endpoints. Terrific, right? That's just slash GraphQL. So if that has a clash with some other URL that you have out there, we allow you to customize it. And at the the same idea with, um, or just above here, is with REST, right? We can do the same idea here where it's like slash API, which is what we're used to saying, seeing inside ASP.NET. And um, we're just basically following that as by a default. But if it doesn't work for you, we allow you to change it. So that's the best part of it. And under the hood, um, the ASP.NET engine is helping drive all of this. So it is incredibly fast and beautiful. But it, uh, you, you'll just have to see for yourself. The final section, and so I guess this is the third section after data sources and the runtime, is defining the individual entities. So this okay. is books and authors. So in this case, I'm saying I have an entity called authors. And from this point forward, I can I can start to say where it comes from, what the fields that I want to use are on it, if I want to map the names of those fields to something new as well. And then I just call it based on how I, I uniquely set up the endpoints for um, or in this case, REST, or if it was a GraphQL, GraphQL would obviously I would be passing in an entire graph to, to receive it, but I would get it by name. So it's pretty great. And uh, so here's the mappings, for example, I don't have any change, but perhaps underscore is just not the way you do things. And so you can change it so that it maps even differently there. So uh, it's really straightforward. The honest truth is to be able to interact with this file after you get several entities in it, is pretty sophisticated because of the opportunity to not get a comma where a JSON wants a comma or adding too many commas can be complicated. That's the reason we have the CLI and the CLI makes it really simple to be able to interact yeah. with. Okay, That's so great. let me just uh, show real quick what it looks like. It looks like what you would expect, no doubt about it. But if I have, let me pull um, a browser and, and, and actually let me run it and then sh show you the browser. So here I am in uh, just a regular command prompt. Mm -hmm. I have my... I, I just typed a notepad so we can look at it here. And, and so here's the, the same file, nothing changed. It's the one we were just looking at. And if I say dab, which I already have installed as a, a .NET global tool, if I just say dab start, it looks for the default name of dab-config.json. I can pass in a custom name if I'm not happy with that, but in this case, I totally am. When I do, it reads it all and it begins spinning up the configuration for, or the container for me, reads all the configuration and starts the endpoint. So now it's running and it gives me both the HTTP and the HTTPS endpoints. And each one of those then, if I have 
I could use a, I mean, I want to do it in a browser just so it's the easiest of everything. And if I just paste that in and say slash API slash books, it does what you would expect, right? It, it gives me that get operation that allows me to go and get that. By the way, this also implements the OData interface, which allows me to do things like select and so only get specific values back. So if I, I don't want all of my columns, I can project those differently. I can add filters in the in the uh, URL as well, just like I would with OData. So there's a lot of power from the REST story overall. Of course, I can put and delete and post as well, right? All of those things are like you would expect. And each one of those can have individual security settings attached to them in the configuration. It, it's pretty great. Um, okay. so. All that being said, I think it's worth just saying we really are an open source, um, an open source tool here. Uh, we love the fact that it works great in Azure, but we understand that that uh, that's not always an option for everybody. So we also love the fact that just as an OSS tool, it's sitting there, able to run behind whatever firewall you want, whatever closed network you want, and everything's fine. And so, in a lot of ways, um, we can see a lot of synergy from being able to support not only all the databases that we're supporting, but all the different scenarios that we're supporting as well. And so there are a, uh, there are a lot of resources that developers can get started. I think the easiest is going to be just AKMS slash DAB slash repo. That takes you right to the GitHub repo where you can start to see everything that's going on and interact, interact with the community through issues and through all the RFCs that are there for the features that we're adding in the next handful of months. And so. There's a lot of uh, cool things happening, and it's an open door for just getting involved and being part of the community or just jumping in and submitting a PR. So there's a lot of neat stuff. Uh, the tool itself is pretty spectacular. The way it, way it integrates um, into Azure, we're really excited about. And the fact that you don't need Azure, everybody's excited about, right? Because now all of a sudden, we have a lot of scenarios that we support. So there it is. Uh, I, I've, I really focused on the REST endpoint, Frank, where um, you can go in and just do a, a simple get request. But we also have total GraphQL support as well that is rich and dynamic. And it's probably worth, I don't know, taking a couple of minutes and showing you that maybe in another episode. I think you're totally right, Jerry. So I'll make sure to re-invite you for our next episode. So thank you a lot for today. People, go check the DAB repo to make sure you learn about all that goodness. And uh, see you in the next episode. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks,